وذعفت الله ربي حلوة 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 حياتي مذ عرفت الله ربي أشرق النور بقلبي ملأ البشر حياتي مذ أضاء الله دربي يا لسعدي وهنائي يا لفوزي وعلى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسماء وما أدراك ما الطارق النجم الثاقب إن كل نفس لما عليها حافظ فلينظر الإنسان من خلق خلق من ماء دافق يخرج من بين السلم والترائب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسماء والطارق والسماء والطارق وما أدعاك ما الطارق والسماء والطارق وما كل نفس لما عليها حافظ فلينظر الإنسان مما خلق خلق من يخرج من بين السلم والطرائب إنه على رجعه لقادر يوم تبل السعائر فما له من قوة ولا ناصر والسماء ذات الرجع والأرض ذات الصدع إنه لقول فصل وما هو بالحصر إنهم يكيدون كيدا وأكيد كيدا إنهم يكيدون 
أكيدون كيدا وأكيد كيدا فمهكل الكافرين أمهلهم رعيدا فمهكل الكافرين أمهلهم رعيدا صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد برابرز سيستر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Anybody want to listen to me anytime? I'm on YouTube. You, know, you don't have to die to listen to me anymore. There's hundreds of me on there. So, Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, barakah of uh, YouTube. <coughs> if you look into the life of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most uh, difficult time in the life of the Prophet ﷺ took place when he was giving da'wah. And you look now at our lives, how easy it is for us to give da'wah. You know, people gave their life propagate the deen for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They died to propagate this deen. If you look at the lives of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, you look at the life of Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, look at the, what was it? It was dawah. It was propagating the deen. As uh, Sheikh Shalabi mentions, he says, Khalid spread the deen and those who became an obstacle, obstacle or impediment, Khalid removed them. And he may have killed hundreds, but he ensured that millions entered into the deen. That millions entered into the deen. But if you envisage, I was in Umrah recently, and we traveled from uh, Mecca to Medina. And I was looking at the terrain. For those who have been for Umrah or Hajj, you look at the, tr- the terrain where the Sahaba radiallahu anhum had to walk. Makkah to Medina isn't that much of a journey compared to what they traveled. What the Sahaba radiallahu anhum traveled. Sham, Iraq. The narration that even some Sahaba radiallahu anhum reached Spain. Now, can you imagine, you know, what that journey must have been like? You know, we went to Gaza after uh, the bombing took place. We, the convoy which went from England, the first convoy. I was part of the convoy. And I remember there was about 250 of us. You'd stop off at the service station. And the service stations are not like England in Tunisia or Algeria or Morocco. By the time the third person used the toilet, it's blocked. And there's only two toilets. And there were brothers who were cracking up. And no exaggeration. There were guys coming to Sheikh, we can't take it anymore. We can't manage. And I was thinking, subhanAllah. And we all found the journey difficult. But compare that to what the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the sacrifice that they gave for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how easy that we have it today. But we, our iman is such that it will not motivate us that we get off our backsides and give our neighbor dawah. Our neighbor dawah. And then we, day in, day out, what do we say? Bro, you know what? Haq. Truth. Me, you going Jannah. 
Only me and you, the other guys, you know what I mean? They were a bit wayward. But me and you going Jannah. SubhanAllah. You know, look at the Christians. Look at the Christians. Look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. Who we say, you know, spent entity. Got nothing. That's what, you know, Muslims say. We on the truth. This is the salvific path. This is the path which takes you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Show us the straight path. And the Mufassireen say, you know, as Surat al Mustaqim is Ma'arifa. It has Alif Lam upon it because there is only one path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no other path other than that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they are motivated enough to come and knock on your doors to call you from what? From Nur ila Dhulamat. From guidance to misguidance. From light to darknesses. And me and you who profess that we have the truth. Our iman is such that it cannot motivate us that we call our neighbor to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we call our friend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you look at the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the ninth year of hijrah. In the life of the Prophet sallallahu sorry, in the ninth year of after revelation descended, this is in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, known as Amul Huzn, the year of grief. Why? Because this was the year in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's beloved wife Khadija radiyallahu anha passed away, and this was also the year where his three days after that, his uncle, three days after Abu Talib passed away. Khadija radiallahu anha passed away. And this is known as Amr Huzn in the life of the Prophet sallallahu And Shia Abu Dhahra mentions that all the attacks that the mushrikeen perpetrated on the Prophet sallallahu placing the attest- intestines on the back of the Prophet sallallahu when he was in sujood, when Abu Jahl tried to attack the Prophet sallallahu all of these took place after the death of Abu Talib. So the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if and Ta'if, they were his relatives as well. And the Prophet ﷺ wanted to give them da'wah and he wanted protection from them as well. So the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if and the narrations differ in some narration that the Prophet ﷺ remained there for 10 days. In other narration, the Prophet ﷺ remained there for 30 days. Not one person embraced Islam. Not one person embraced Islam. Who was giving the da'wah? It was the Prophet ﷺ. There was no greater die than the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ stood on the mountain of Safa and he gathered the people toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the way, if they had an important issue, they would stand on the mountain of Safa and they would shout and the people would gather at the foot of the mountain. And the Prophet ﷺ said to them, if I was to tell you that behind this mountain there is an army ready to attack you, would you believe me? And in one voice he said, of course, you are Sadiq al Amin, impeccable character. You know, you are the most upright from amongst us. And then the Prophet wasallam said, I warn you that a day will come that you will stand in front of Allah and that there is no God but Allah and I am his messenger. And his own uncle Abu Lahab said, Tabban laka ya Muhammad ali hadha jama'atana. He said, may you, may you be destroyed, Muhammad. Is this what you, what you have gathered us for? And nobody embraced Islam. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says, You know, I was the 49th or 50th person to embrace Islam. And when Umar radiallahu anhu embraced Islam, six years after the first call, six years, in a period of six years, only 50 people embraced Islam. 50 people embraced Islam. At the hands of who? The greatest of Da'i sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave these people da'wah. And every single one of them turned away. And then they sent the urchins and the low lives of Ta'if. And the narrations mentioned that they stood on the side of the street. 
And Zayd ibn Harith radiallahu anhu was with the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And they began to pelt the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with rocks. Until his entire body began to flow with blood. His shoes began to stick to his feet because of the blood. And Zayd ibn Harith radiallahu anhu, they would throw a rock and he would come in this way. And it would hit Zayd. And sometimes it would hit the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Aisha radiallahu anha asked the message of Allah. She said, oh message of Allah, what was the most difficult time in your life? Was it the battle of Uhud? When 70 Sahaba radiallahu anhum were martyred for this deen? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, no. It was the occasion of Ta'if. It was occasion of Ta'if. When I came to give these people da'wah and they turned upon me. And then... Subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the angel Jibra'il and with the angel Jibra'il alayhi salatu salam was the angel which controls the mountains and Jibra'il said to the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said Allah has seen what these people of Taif have done to you if you wish with me is the angel which controls the mountains if you wish I will command him and they, he will crush the people of Taif, he will make the mountains collapse on the people of Taif. And the Prophet ﷺ refused the offer. He declined the offer. And he said, maybe somebody from their progeny will embrace. Maybe somebody with their progeny will embrace. And you know what? The people of Taif were one of the last people to embrace Islam. <clears throat> they were one of the last people to embrace Islam. And they put all these funny conditions and the Prophet ﷺ didn't accept any of them. But when, after the demise of the Prophet ﷺ, the people rebelled. There were three cities in which nobody really, hardly anybody rebelled. One was Mecca, the other one was Medina, and the third was Taif. The people of Taif didn't rebel. They remained firm upon the deen. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, maybe if somebody... From the progeny will embrace Islam. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, what did he say? He said, what did, did, did he say, you know, the, write them off. You know, write these people off. They're not worth it. You know, that's how sometimes we are. You know, they're not worth it. You know, kuf. They waste time with the kuf for. You know, they're not worth the dawah. Subhanallah. You know, if it wasn't for the sacrifice of people like the Sahaba radiallahu anhu and those people who came after them. I ask you, in the time of Umar ibn Khattab, where, where did Islam reach? In a period of ten and a half years, where did Islam reach? The Islam reached as far as Makran. You know where Makran is? It's about a couple of hundred miles away from Karachi. It's in Pakistan. Makran is in Pakistan. In a period of ten and a half years, that's how far Islam reached. Why? Because these people had a passion. They had a passion to propagate the deen. The iman was such that it motivated them. And then what did the Prophet ﷺ say after Taif? He said, what did he say? He said, Allahumma inni ashku alayka dha'fa quwwati wa qilla tahilati wa hawani ala nasi ya arham rahimin he said, oh Allah, I complain to you about what? Man, I complain to you about the Jews, the Zionists, the Americans, the Europeans, the Mushrikeen. No, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? In the most difficult time in his life, by his own words, the Prophet ﷺ said, oh Allah, I complain to you about my own weakness. Subhanallah. About my own weakness and my insignificance in the eyes of other people. And my lack of ingenuity. And my lack of ingenuity. Who is this? This was the greatest of Dai sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam utilized methods of dawah which were unparalleled before him. Any method that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam within the hadood. The Prophet ﷺ could utilize for da'wah, he, he utilized them. When Shima, you know, his, his, this was his 
This was his sister by, by Rida. When she came into the gathering of the Prophet sallallahu she was a mushrik. He brought her into the masjid Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he gave her dawah, he took off his cloak for her. Then the people of Najran, the Christians of Najran came. And when they came, and they wanted to speak about to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave them dawah, he sat with them. And then they began to speak with each other about something. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, what are you speaking about? And they said, no, nothing. And the Messenger Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked them again. And he said, it's time for our prayer. These are Christians. It's time for our prayer. We need to pray. So the Prophet sallallahu who are these? These were people who believed that Isa was the son of Allah. They believed in Trinity. Where were they sitting? They were sitting in the second most holiest masjid on the face of this earth. And what did the Prophet sallallahu say to them? He said, pray here. He said, pray here. Why? Because his concern for them coming toward the haq, it overrode everything else. He told them, pray in the masjid, in Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because this was the concern that he had. And we, you know, Allah says about us in the Quran, you've heard the Tablighi brothers say so many times, you know, you are the best of people. Best of people when? When? When you dissipate your entire existence, you know, in, in, in accumulating bricks and mortar, in accumulating, you know, the biggest car that you can, your entire life, the only thing that gets you out of bed in the morning is what? It's not that you have to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's that the fact that you have to get to university. It's the fact that you've got an assignment to do. It's the fact that you have to go to work. If that is what, if that is what inspires you to wake up in the morning, then what is Akbar to you, I ask you? What, you all say Allah Akbar. Allah is the greatest. But many of our lives are totally contrary to our statement. And you know what they call this? They call this hypocrisy. That you say with your tongue, you say Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest. But your entire life is accumulating. You have become the slave of the dollar and the dime. You are more inspired by the apprentice than you are by the Quran. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ta'isa Abdul Dirham. What Ta'is Abdul Dinar destroyed the slave of the dirham, of the pound, and destroyed is the slave of the dinar. That he's, that's what he aspires for. That's what motivates him. We wake up in the morning because we got to get to work, but we can't wake up for the Fajr Salah. So who is Akbar in our eyes? We are ready to upset Allah. But we don't want to upset our boss. No, no, no. We need to get to work. So who's our inspiration in life? And Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatin He said, you are the best of people. When? When? Not because you live in Leicester. Because many of you guys who live in Leicester think Highfields is Darul Islam. Is Darul Khilafah. All you need is a Khalif. And that, that suffices. And I always say this. And, and you know, Alhamdulillah. You know what the Indians have achieved, what the Indians and the Pakistanis and the Bengalis have achieved in England is very good. In the sense that they've been amazing. The way that they've protected the deen. The masajid on every corner. Every corner there's a masjid. Two, three of them. Every madarsa, you know, every, every corner, there's masajid. Mashallah, the Darul looms. You know, and it's amazing. Protection of the deen. Nobody can touch us. But when it comes to dawah, we are totally defunct. When it comes to protecting the deen, and, us, uh, and creating institutes, 
and masajids and organizations. Alhamdulillah, we're unparalleled. But that's as far as it goes. Then you have your masjids. Oh, oh masjids. And this is literally throughout the Asian community. Pakistani masjid. Bengali masjid. Bengali masjid. Gujarati masjid. Gujarati then split into two. Surti Bruchi. <laughs> and then you got the Miyabai somewhere in the middle. And now we got the Somalian masjids. Subhanallah. Since when did the house of Allah become Somalian? Now, when, since when did the house of Allah become Bruchi or Surti? You talk about, yeah, Bilal. Look at the sacrifice of Bilal. Look at Bilal, look how he sacrificed. And this was the amazing thing. Why is Bilal? Why is, why is Khubab? Why is Lubaina? Why is Oneza? Why is Sumayya? Why is Ammar? Why is Yasid special in this deen? Because they sacrificed when nobody else sacrificed. They gave their life. They gave their blood. They gave their sweat for the sake of Allah. When nobody else sacrificed. Bilal could have easily said, you know what? The Prophet ﷺ said the time will come when this deen will be, you know, it will be dominant. I'll wait until that time. I'll wait until that time. For this time, I'm Mo. For this time, you know, my name is uh, Bill. And I'm not talking about Bilal, I'm talking about m many people who are like this today. Now, uh, my, you know, I, you know, and the, Alhamdulillah, in many ways, you know, with the father of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're in England and we're not in many other parts of the West. That we, we are very proud of our identity, our Islamic identity. If I travel to many other parts, subhanAllah, it actually scares me. It actually scares me. But you know, if Bilal came today, I ask you, how many of us would give him dawah? Bilal would not even be allowed to be a committee member in our masjids. Because he doesn't come from our tribe. He doesn't come from our clan. He doesn't come from Dhaka. He doesn't say Pony. You know, Gujarati know what I'm talking about here. Yeah? But that's the reality. That's the reality. The deen is meant to be dynamic. The Sahaba, they reached out. And they gave the dawah. It didn't matter. The Prophet ﷺ created a thing called an ummah. Salman, the per Salman the Persian, was a part of this ummah. Suhaib the Roman was a part of this ummah. Bilal the Habshi was a part of this ummah. On the battle of Handak, the Prophet ﷺ divided the, the Muhajirun and the Ansar into groups of ten. And he gave them duty to dig the trenches. And then there, was, then there was Salman. Salman wasn't a muhajir nor was he ansar. So what did they say? What did the sahaba of the Allah say? Did they say, you know, bro, you know, he's not Bengali. We're not really interested. You know, he's not Somalian. We're not interested. No. The ansar and the muhajirun began to fight with each other. They both said, we want him. And the muhajirin said, no, because he came to Medina from outside, he's a muhajir. And the Ansar said, no, no, he was already in Medina when the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came. So he's an Ansar. So what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he's not from the Muhajir, nor is he from the Ansar. He is from me and my family. Because he created this thing called an Ummah. You know, and I was recently, mashallah, I, was, I gave a talk in Batley, and some brothers came to me. Uh, one was an Afro-Caribbean brother, and one was a Pakistani brother. And I just spoke about, you know, outreach projects and how we should have outreach projects. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is what he did. He little issue, he, you know, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a vision. You know, he had a goal. And you could see that, how that manifested in the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Petty little issues want an issue for the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. They had great goals. And this is why in a period of ten and a half years, look at what Umar radiallahu anhu achieved. In a period of ten and a half years, Islam reached all the way to Makran. 
all the way to Makran. In a period of ten and a half years, Umar radiallahu anhu defeated the two superpowers of the day, the Romans and the Persians. The Persians had been a superpower for more than 1200 years. 1200 years. And then Umar radiallahu anhu came and he, and he destroyed them. And he brought a system which was a system of justice. And he removed the Romans as well. And then Umar radiallahu anhu, what did he do? He started things like the welfare system. Every child, can you believe this? Every child which was born in the Muslim world in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu would be, given a child, would be given child benefit. Upon occasion a group of people came into Medina and Umar radiallahu anhu who was at that time the most powerful man on the face of this earth <coughs> most powerful man on the face of this earth he told Abdurrahman ibn Awf he said Abdurrahman me and you look after these people who was Abdurrahman ibn Awf? Abdurrahman ibn Awf anhu was a multi-millionaire, one of the ten who was guaranteed Jannah. And you know his sister, he was from the Quraysh, his sister was married to Bilal radiallahu anhu. Today it's like, you know, no, you don't come from my tribe, you don't come from my clan. So you know, can't get married to you. Me, and I apologize, I don't know certain castes, etc. So I'll stick to my own. You know, my own, not my, my caste, but my own people. You know, me, I'm a Raja. I'm a Mughal. You know who the Mughals were? The Mughals were people, the Mongols, who ruled India. So this guy, he lives in England, somewhere in Sparkbrook. <laughs> and his great, 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 great grandfather, great, 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 great grandfather, <laughs> happened to be some Mughal. And now he's a taxi driver and he said, nah, I'm a Mughal. And the other one says, no, I'm a Raja, we used to rule as well. You're, you're working a takeaway. You're a takeaway, Wawa. But this is the thing. Because see, that which is the identity by Allah is no longer an ide identity. We don't regard it as our first identity. When you lie in your grave by Allah, Allah will not ask you, were you an Arab? Were you Somalian? Were you Pakistani? He will ask you, you know, did you believe? How did you spend your life? Did you wake up for the Fajr Salah? Or was your entire purpose in life to accumulate goods? Was your aspiration you aspired that you lived in Highfield, so you, then you wanted to move to Evington. <laughs> that you had a micro, and then you looked at your neighbor who had a BMW, said so you wanted a BMW. That brings her happiness? Do you think that brings happiness? Happiness is knowing your purpose in life. It's having a goal. You look at the most famous man on the face of the earth. Look at Michael Jackson. You look at Whitney Houston. No, they had everything which many would dream at their feet. Did it bring happiness to them? It didn't bring happiness to them. But you can dissipate your existence. Your 40, 50, 60 years. You know, in pursuing something that you are never going to really achieve. You know, Nuruddin Zingi rahimahullah. Nuruddin was the teacher of Salahuddin. They say if there was no Nuruddin, there would have been no Salahuddin. Ibn Athi rahimahullah, the famous Muwarriq says that I have studied the life of all the Khulafai Rashidun and those who came after them. And he said since Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the Muslims never had a leader who was as just as Nuruddin rahimahullah. And he was the teacher of Salahuddin. And the narration mentioned that one day he was going out with his counterparts. And he was on a horse and all of a sudden he began to ride the horse very quickly. And they're watching and there's a shadow. The shadow of the horse is in front of the horse and he's, and he's riding quick, quick. And then all of a sudden he, he turns the horse around and now the shadow's behind the horse and he's riding. And then he comes back to his men and he said, do you know why I did that? He said, I wanted to show you the example of the dunya. 
No matter how much you chase it, you will never be able to catch it. And when you turn your back away from the dunya, the dunya will chase you. And this is what Luqman Hakim Rahimahullah says. Work for the dunya according to the time that you are going to live in it. And work for the akhirah according to the time that you're going to live in the akhirah. And that eternal abode is by Allah, is the akhirah. So then what, what makes us dissipate our entire existence? What makes us act like that we're never going to die? What makes us that fajr time comes? That we can't motivate ourselves to go for the fajr salah? What, what, what is it? That we say that the deen that we have is the truth, but we never propagate it. Is that an indication of our Iman? If it is an indication of our Iman, then we need to work on it. Because see, you're either your Iman is up here, subhanAllah. You're either your Iman is up here and it never goes down, because the belief of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that Iman increases and it decreases. So you're either your Iman is up here and it never goes down and then you're an angel and that ain't happening. Or it's down here and it never, you never feel a difference. It's rock bottom. It's on red all the time. In the time of, of, in the, time of the Prophet wasallam, <laughs> upon occasion, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu saw Hanzala radiallahu anhu. Hanzala was a Badri Sahabi. And he saw Hanzala sitting and crying. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, Oh Hanzala, well, why are you crying? Why do you look so sad? And Hanzala radiallahu anhu said, Abu Bakr, nafaqa Hanzala. Hanzala has become a manafiq. A Badri Sahabi? So Abu Bakr said, impossible. Hanzala, Badri Sahabi? Never. How could Hanzala become a manafiq? And he said, Hanzala has become a manafiq. And he asked him, how? He said, when I'm in the company of the Prophet sallallahu it's as though Jannah and Jahannam are in front of us. Jannah and Jahannam are in front of us. That's how real they were. This is what the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. For them, Jannah was, wallahi, was real. Why? Because their imams were at that level. Jannah was real for them. They believed. They sacrificed everything that they had. Why? Because they, Allah was real. Jannah and Jahannam was real. And this is why they could put their hands in their pocket and they could spend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Upon occasion, the Prophet sallallahu was sitting with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And the young man came to the gathering of the Prophet sallallahu And he said, oh message of Allah, I'm a yateem. And I have a garden and I want to create a wall around my garden. But there's one tree right in the middle. And my neighbor who's a Muslim as well, he owns that tree. He owns that tree. And I've asked him to sell me that tree and he won't. So the Prophet ﷺ called this man and this man was actually a manafiq. He said with his tongue what was not in his heart. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, he said, sell me that tree and I promise you a tree in Jannah. And he was a manafiq and he refused. And Abu Dahda was sitting there. And Abu Dahda anhu said, he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, Oh Messenger of Allah, if I bring you that tree, would you promise me a tree in Jannah? And the Prophet said, I promise you a tree in Jannah. And Abu Dahda anhu went and he said to the Manafiq, he said, Sell me that tree. And the Manafiq said, I didn't sell it to the Nabi. You think I'm going to sell it to you? And he said, Do you know who I am? He said, Of course, Abu Dahda. He said, Do you know about my garden? He said, Who doesn't know about the garden of Abu Dahda? It was beautiful garden in Medina, beautiful well, a palace. And Abu Dahda radiallahu anhu said, sell me that one tree and I promise you, I will give you my entire garden. And he said, you're having a laugh. And he said, try me. And he gave him that one tree. And Abu Dahda is elated because he knows that once he goes into Jannah, he ain't coming back out. And he goes into the gathering of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet is sitting with the Sahaba radiallahu anhu and Allah has revealed to him what has happened. And Abu Dahda entered the gathering and the Prophet said, Abu Dahda, when you went away, I promise you one tree in Jannah. By now I swear by Allah that your Jannah is full of trees. You're full of trees. But then the amazing thing was that Abu Dahda went and, he, and his wife was in the palace. 
And Abu Dahda radiallahu anhu went to his wife and he said, hurry up out of the garden. And she said, why? He said, because I have exchanged it for trees in Jannah that you can travel under their shade for a hundred years and it will not finish. And what did the wife say? She said, Rabbi Halbay. She said, what a bargain. What a bargain. Wife, for them, Allah was real. For them, Jannah and Jahannam was real. For us, subhanallah, our iman is such that it doesn't even motivate us to pray our salah. Our iman is such, you know, we are more motivated by the dunya than we are for our eternal life. And this is something that we need to work on. And they went into the gathering of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu and they told the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Bakr said, oh, Messenger of Allah, Abu Bakr has become a Manafiq as well. Hanza said, Hanza has become a Manafiq. And the Messenger of Allah asked them why. And they said, oh, Messenger of Allah, when you were in your company, it says, though Jannah and Jahannam are in front of us. But when we go back home, domestic chores, our Iman decreases, our state decrease, changes. And the Prophet said, I swear by Allah, if you could remain in the same state that you are in front of me, the angels would descend. And they would shake your hands and they would do salam with you on the streets. But this is why, my dear respected brothers and sisters, the Iman is something that we make an effort on. Remain in good company. Give dawah. Wallahi, amazing way of strengthening your Iman is to give dawah. Because it kills the nafs. You go and you give dawah to your Muslim brothers. You go and give dawah to the non Muslims. You're sincere. You ask Allah for guidance. Subhanallah, you will see how it strengthens your iman. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who entire life is spent, you know, for his sake. Our mornings are spent for his sake. Afternoons are spent for his sake. Evenings are spent for his sake. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in dunya. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite the gender for those. And mashallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the brothers and the sisters who are involved in the organization. Mashallah, may Allah give them istiqama. And listen. For those who cannot help financially in dawah, you can give your time, can't you? Yeah? You can give your time. You can give some effort. You know, this, this is an obligation. Allah said, Kuntum khayra ummatin He said, you are the best of people taken out for the benefit of humanity. Humanity must see your khayr. Your neighbors can't see your khayr. I'll tell you why your neighbors can't see your khayr. Because there is no more non-Muslim living in Highfields and Evington. Before Muslims used to move to an area, the non-Muslims would follow them. Muslims left Spain, the non-Muslims followed them. Now, Muslims move into an area, they know, you know, hey, the boys hanging on the street corners, the drug dealers, the big cars, the lot of noise, and the smell of curry, and everything else that goes with it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who, 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 you know, who serve the deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who truly, who truly believe that Allah is Akbar with our hearts. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.